what we have discussed so far is a principled way of thinking about investment in a stock market of possibilities. How to go about creating an optimal distribution of wealth, an allocation of wealth across different stocks. In other words, an optimal portfolio. But of course, you realize that we have created a highly sanitized, a highly simplified view of how real stock markets actually function. And so it would be appropriate to provide some disclaimers uh, as to the worth and the value of all the calculations we have done. Now to begin, to optimize a portfolio, remember we wanted to maximize a doubling rate of wealth. And so we maximize it by maximizing doubling rates over all choices of portfolios. To find, to extract the best portfolio, the optimal portfolio. Now in general, this is a highly nonlinear problem. It's an optimization problem which involves a search in a potentially high dimensional space with a lot of constraints. Right? These portfolio vectors have to have non-negative elements and they have to add to one. The function you're optimizing is highly nonlinear. This is not easy. It is clear that it's going to be computationally expensive. For those of you who go on to take a course in mathematical optimization, you will recognize that the theory which governs this is called Kuhn-Tucker theory. And you'll find out that the optimal portfolios will have to satisfy certain conditions called Kuhn-Tucker conditions. But the takeaway message is, whatever we do, this is going to be difficult and expensive. So if we want the very best possibility, it's going to cost us time and effort. But there's much worse in terms of stumbling blocks for us. To optimize the delta of A's, the doubling rates over portfolios A, Remember, this represented an expectation. Delta of A, the doubling rate for portfolio A, was the expected value of the logarithm of the wealth ratio corresponding to some unknown distribution for the stocks. In general, we don't know this distribution. If we knew the chance laws that govern life, our well, life would be a lot easier, wouldn't it? In general, we don't know. Nobody knows what are the exact chance laws which govern stock movements. We don't even know these approximately, perhaps. And if we don't know the underlying chance law, the underlying distribution, then we have no hope of writing out an explicit computation for an expectation according to that chance law. This suggests then that perhaps we have to find ways to infer, learn, approximate underlying chance laws. All today we are in the realm of heuristics. But even if we thought we knew the chance law, there is a further objection. And that is that the assumption that the market is stationary, stochastically speaking, in other words, you've got a chance law which does not change from day to day. This is highly unrealistic. Of course, stock movements on a given day inform what's going to happen the next day. If you're in a bear market, then stock prices are generally dropping before they bottom out and start rising. If you're in a bull market, stock prices are generally rising. It is too simplistic to assume that the laws are a, stationary in time, they don't change in time, and two, that the laws result in independent trials. Each day potentially affects the next day. Of course, this leads to very complicated chance descriptions of an underlying chance process. Is there a way forward? If there is a way forward, then it's got to take into account a reality where stock price relative distributions change with time and there could be dependencies across the days. Not just across stocks, but across individual days of trading. Now it turns out that the theory we have developed can be extended, expanded into a domain 
which deals with the construction of what are called universal portfolios, which will work for any collection of chance laws as long as there's some kind of asymptotic stability for the laws. You understand that the laws are allowed to vary wildly from day to day, then there's no hope. So we need to have some kind of symmetry pulling things in. These are called stationary ergodic laws. But that takes us very far afield, and of course we understand that the technicalities now are going to be significant. Right? But now there is a theory of universal portfolios which handles a large basket of possibilities. But this still requires expensive individual optimization. And now one more, and this is the most significant stumbling block to what I've told you. Right? We could in some sense handle changing distributions, different distributions. But what I've ignored in all of this is that ultimately investment advisors, stock brokers, need to make a living. They charge you to invest in the stock market. And typically, every time you change an allocation of stocks, you pay transaction fees. Now, it may be OK to pay a transaction fee once at the start of the game. It may be OK to pay a transaction fee once in a long while. But our procedure here required constant rebalancing. At the end of each day, you go ahead and look at what is the worth of your portfolio spread across the stocks, rebalance it so that the stock portfolio aggregates are in the proportion according to your choice of portfolio. And we have to do this on a daily basis. Every day is going to incur transaction costs. And these transaction costs will sink any possible gains you might make. Okay, So these are all these disclaimers to a general theory. A warning that the theory in isolation can't just be used naively. You can't just go in, plug it in, and say, there's ex machina, and plug it in, turn the crank, and out comes wealth. Now, life is much more complex than that. Right? But what have we learned? Now, it might be appropriate to conclude this particular discussion with yet another slogan. And what is our slogan? The law of large numbers gives us a principled way to think about stock peregrinations, stock movements. Gives us a principled way to think about allocations of wealth across various stocks. And it gives us certain guideposts, certain things which are potentially feasible in terms of the growth of wealth, of course, in an idealized world. In practice, we move away from the idealism and say, given that we have a messy real world, what can these principles teach us about actual investment? And again, the law of large numbers tells us here are some principled ways to think about it. Here are some principled heuristics that we can extract from the ruins. Of course, heuristics don't have a priori guarantees. But in any case, a course of action based upon principled heuristics is much to be preferred over a course of action based upon just random gut feelings, where there's no thought or cogitation behind what we are doing, what we are trying to optimize. Of course, we could get more information about the process and about our analysis. If we wished, we could go beyond concentration. As I told you, the, the law of large numbers is a crude scalpel. It tells us roughly where things are going, viewed with a heavy, very heavy normalization, with a very heavy thumb pushing down the scale. But we can get much finer information if you look closer to the limit points using the central limit theorem. But we won't take the time to do that here. I shall illustrate for you a finer view of central tendency through the ages of the bell curve in an application in a quite different context. Next.